Praise God, right? Do we love Jesus Christ? Are we thankful for his love for us? Amen. Well, I'm thankful that we're here today worshiping the Lord. Do you know there is going to come a Sunday we won't be here? Is this the last one? I don't know, but wouldn't it be great if it is? Yes. Well, we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. This is the 37th message in Acts. I I mean, I'm like, wow. Well, guess what? We, even though it's still September, we're really only looking at six or seven more before we end the year because we'll have Thanksgiving. We're going to have Christmas. I'm going to be on vacation. Pastor Jacob filling in. We have communion. So we are coming into the last stretch of Acts, and I pray and trust that Acts, the church on the move, this series has impacted your life and us as a church. Today we're going to be speaking about some things that I imagine is not probably commonly talked about today all across our country, but it's where we are in Acts as we go through the Word of God. What can we glean from our passage today? Does it have relevance today? Let me ask you a question. What do you think is the fastest growing religion in America? Islam is, of course, the fastest growing major religion. It is sweeping through the world. But would you be surprised if I told you that the fastest growing spiritual identification in America is witchcraft? witchcraft. The fastest growing spiritual identification in our country today. The number of its adherents is doubling, everyone, every 30 months. It is doubling. In a census of 1980, in America, people who affiliated themselves with the occult were so small. In fact, no specific data could even be assigned to them. That's how small it was. They were grouped with Muslims, Buddhists, Unitarians, and others, which all together was only 2% of America in 1980. But when the results of the U.S. Census all the way back in 2010 were published, it had witchcraft 20 years later as the fourth largest religion in the United States. And according to an article in 2015 in the American Society for the Defense of Tradition and Family, Dr. Michael Brown said, I was stunned to learn that among millennials there are more witches than Presbyterians. Uh, We're not Presbyterian, but that's the quote. Did you know that the satanic temple religion is growing exponentially beginning with a handful of members? In 2021, it now has thousands of chapters all over the United States and the globe globe from Stockholm to London, from Los Angeles to Texas, thousands upon thousands of satanic chapters. It is a well-organized religion whose documentary on the TNT entitled Hail Satan premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah last month. This is what's going on in our nation. You know, this is almost stuff that we may not be shocked by anymore. You know, Amazon, they have banned any vaccine documentaries that question the official narrative of vaccine safety. Yet it sells books promoting Satanism in numerous numbers such as Satanism, A Beginner's Guide to the Religious Worship of Satan. This is all sweeping through our land. Spiritism, Satanism, mysticism, astrology, channeling, psychic readings, ancestral spirit guides, witchcraft, and Wicca are all part of the growing occultism in America today. This is spreading through our land, everybody. It's infecting our country. 
It is the true pandemic. Hmm. What does that mean for the church? What can we see in God's word? This morning, as the church on the move that we want to be, our message title today is Dealing with Demons. Whoa. Dealing with Demons. Probably not main, uh, main themes throughout our land today. Probably not mainstream. But this is what we're going to look at in God's Word. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul's trip to the epicenter, the occult center of the ancient world, Ephesus. And we will briefly touch on this massive subject of the occult, of demons, of evil spirits, and demon possession. And what can we do about it? What should you be doing about it in your life? So after Paul's ministry in Corinth that we looked at just a few short weeks ago, Paul returned home to his base in Antioch, and he concluded that second missionary journey in chapter 18, verse 22. Then, after an unspecified amount of time, Paul now sets out on his third missionary journey, his longest missionary journey, and this journey will last for four years. Three of those years will be spent at Ephesus. Three of the four years on this journey. Acts 20, verse 31. So as we consider this, Luke's major focus of Paul's third missionary journey will center on the events that happened right here in Ephesus. The first of which was the clash of Christianity with the world of demons and the occult. Christianity is now going to clash with evil. Acts 19, 8 through 20. So in this section this morning, we're going to first look at the demon beating that takes place, which leads to a book burning, which leads to the word growing. I love how that ends. Amen? Amen. Lord, I pray this morning as we look at your word that... We should always come to it, Lord, seeing it as your truth, which it is, your inspired word. We want your word, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. May it challenge us today. May it do a work in our life. Lord, may we yield to your spirit, be blessed, be encouraged, and Lord, even convicted if necessary. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you that you love us. We thank you for the time we were able to spend singing praises to you. I trust, Lord, that you were truly pleased. May our hearts be open to you now. May our hearts be attentive. In your name we pray, amen. So let's start off with this demon beating by looking at this in Acts 19, 13 through 16. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish uh, chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. There's where we start. But before we look at these verses, let's see the context. Everybody, I don't care how many opportunities, if I have an opportunity, context matters. You don't pluck scripture off and apply it how you want. Context of the God's word matters. Context is everything. Acts 19, 1 through 7, this encounter with the 12, we already looked at when we examined the whole subject of tongues in the book of Acts. So I'm going over that. Acts 19, 8 through 10, Luke summarizes almost all of Paul's ministry in Ephesus in just these three verses, telling us that Paul, when driven from the synagogue, took his newly converted disciples with him 
and continued his teaching ministry daily for two years in the school of Tyrannus. We don't know anything about him. Paul's apostolic teaching ministry in Ephesus was confirmed, we see in these verses, by God through extraordinary miracles, which included the deliverance of those possessed, the word calls it, by evil spirits, verse 12. And that miracle caught the attention of some Jewish exorcists. They're like, hey, hmm. And the demon beating took place and the book burning took place early now in Paul's ministry at Ephesus, which then led to many, many people coming to know Christ, continuing his years spent now in Ephesus teaching and training them. And then in chapter 19, verses 23 through 41, the next event Luke records is the riots of the silversmiths, which takes place at the very end of Paul's ministry at Ephesus. There you have the overview. We're going to look now back to Acts 19, 13 through 16. This is the only time, everyone, the only time the word exorcist you will see in the entire Word of God. It's the only time this word is used. It comes from the word to adjure or to take an oath coupled with this word out, okay? It is the person involved or invokes, this person invokes supernatural persons or powers using magical formulas to drive out evil spirits. So this exorcist, what they do is they use a higher power or a formula to do the driving out. These Jewish exorcists we see here, they were extremely popular there in Ephesus and were believed to have command of some particularly effective spells. So why not add this Jesus spell? Let's get one thing clear here. This word exorcist is used here of these Jewish uh, men. It is never used of Jesus Christ. Never. Jesus nor the Apostle Paul were exorcists. Jesus did not use magical spells or formulas. He just simply spoke and they obeyed. Amen. Simply spoke, just like he did in creation. Let there be light. He simply spoke. The Apostle Paul also used no magical formulas, spells, or incantations. He simply spoke in the name of Jesus, and evil spirits were driven out. They were not exorcists. We saw that in Acts 16, verse 18, where it said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out at that very moment. It didn't just... Ugh, Maybe, no, boom, gone. However, when these seven sons of a Jewish chief priest attempted to drive the evil spirit out of a man by invoking the name of Jesus as if he were some magical formula, uh, they met with some disaster. The evil spirit in the man said, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? I had to do it. The evil spirit used two different words for the word knowing here. Why do they say recognize and know? Why the two different words? Very interesting. This word, I recognize Jesus, this is the word which means know by interaction and by experience. And this word, I know about Paul, this word means to know about or know understanding. I know about or I know who he is. It is the weaker verb for knowing here. So this evil spirit certainly recognized Jesus by interaction. 
and experience, as we're going to see, all evil spirits do. His interaction and experience with Jesus, it goes all the way back to the creation week. Turn with me to Mark 5 for some further insight, where we're going to see the Lord's interaction with demons. Mark 5, verses 1 and 2. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Jesus met a man. Actually, there are two men seen in Matthew 8, but Mark focuses on this one man who was possessed with an unclean spirit. Before we move on in God's Word, what is an unclean spirit? Unclean spirit is the same as an evil spirit, and they are the same as demons. We're going to see in verse 16 that he was one who had been demon-possessed. You see, what you have to understand is demons is who they are. Unclean or evil spirits are what they are like, all right? The origin of demons is debated, but I don't understand the debate. I believe this undoubtedly. Demons, everyone, are fallen angels having fell with Satan, Lucifer, their leader, in his rebellion against God in Isaiah 14. 12 through 14, or Ezekiel 28, 11 through 17. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9, twice refer to the dragon, the serpent of old who deceives, who is the devil, Satan, quote, and his angels who were all thrown down. Matthew 25 Verse 41, Jesus said that an eternal fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. That is, those fallen angels now called demons, evil spirits, unclean spirits. With this understanding of who we are dealing with, let's go back to Mark. Mark 5, 6 through 7, coupled with Mark 5, verse 1 and 2. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him, and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. This man had never met Jesus, but the demons in him knew and recognized Jesus. Controlling the man they possessed, they ran to Jesus, bowed down before him, and addressed him as they already knew who he was, the son of the most high God. Do you see that? They can say that because they certainly knew Jesus by interaction and experience. They recognized Jesus from their days when they saw him and knew him in his Trinitarian glory before the creation of the world and men. Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, was their creator. He created them, and it was he who cast them out of heaven along with their leader, Satan, and he condemned them to the eternal fire which has been prepared for them. That place prepared for them is no other than hell, its very self. Notice that they pleaded with Jesus that he might not torment them. When you go look at the parallel passage in Matthew 8, it gives us a little more insight. It says this, have you come here to torment us before the time? Before the time. 
You recall in Luke 16, 28, where the rich man in hell, he begged that somebody might go and warn his brothers that they will not also come to this place of torment. You remember that? What we see here is that they recognize Jesus as their creator and that they know there is a fixed time for their torment. There's a fixed time coming. There is no changing it, and they know it. There's a fixed time coming when they, along with their leader, will go to this place of torment. Demons are hell-bound, but for now they're free to roam. They're free to deceive the world. They're free to be like their leader, set within the limits of God. Praise God. We have to let these things sink in. Satan and his demons are evil. They are the epitome of what is bad and wicked. They are the epitome of this. Incredibly, this is shocking, Matthew 12, 45. Some are even more wicked than others, as if the others have any good in them. They are unclean, meaning that they are morally reprehensible. They are perverted in all their actions, intellect, and will. Like their leader, Satan, they are utterly confirmed in their hatred of God and all God's children. They hate you, brothers and sisters, with a pure form of hate. They follow their leader in his mad pursuit. Demons never repent, never seek forgiveness. They never pray as they delight in sin and evil and leading men into sin, ultimately to hell itself. Their aim is identical to their leader's aim, and that is to kill, steal, and destroy the lives of people. They have no guilt. They have no desire for deliverance. And in their cruelty, they delight in tormenting whomever they may torment. These demons are spirits. They have no flesh. Ephesians 6.12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. As spirits, we have a formidable and dangerous foe. As spirits, they are above the natural laws we are confined to of the universe. Just as good angels like Gabriel can move from the third heaven right to here, so demons can move here from America to China instantaneously. They're not confined to our laws. As spirits, beings, a legion of them, up to 5,000 can inhabit one man, Luke 8, 30. As spirits, they are invisible. Do you see them here now? But they may be right here, right now, in this worship service. Elisha, remember, he was given eyes to see the angel army of God. And the Apostle Paul, he was given the eyes to see the horrible locust demons in the plagues and the tribulation judgments that will pour out of the abyss to deceive the world in the book of Revelation. If God gave us that momentary eyesight to peel back the veil, would we be shocked at the world of evil spirits that we would see? But because they are spirits, listen, it does not mean that they are not genuine persons. Just as God the Father who is spirit, he is a genuine person. They are persons with intellects, sensibilities, wills, and they have moral responsibility for God is going to hold them accountable. Notice in Acts 19, our text, the personal pronouns. I recognize, I know we even know they have emotions. James says in James 2.19, they believe in God and shudder. They know who to shudder against. 
The Bible reveals some things to us that open the doorways to demonic activity. One is the occult. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 14, go read that. The other is false gods. Deuteronomy 32, verse 17 and verse 3. Another is drugs and mind-altering substances. Galatians 5.20, which falls in line with sorcery and witchcraft, which was the use of magic with the implementation of mind-altering drugs. It's where we get our word pharmacia, from which we get our word pharmacy, the administration of drugs. Drugs and alcohol alter the mind. They also open the floodgate of sinfulness and demon oppression, and yes, even possession. Christians have freedom and Christian liberty, many say, to drink, but why drink to something that has ushered the floodgate of demonic activity into the world and has dragged so many people into addiction when you have so many other things you may drink? That's just a good question to think about. Why identify? with something that's so identifiable, ungodly. Next is abominations. The abominations of sexual immorality. We get the word pornea, pornography, licentiousness, adultery, premarital sexual relationships, unnatural relationships between men and men, and women and women, and the giving away to a mind of depravity. These things usher in, and we see the, ultimately the abomination and curses we see in God's Word flood in demonic activity. Do we not see these things in open, braggadocious display in our society in America today, the giving over to the reprobate mind that is celebrated in the public square with man's sinful fist flaunting in the face of God? We see this throughout the world today. This not only opens the door to demon possession, but demon oppression, and this is how people and nations are destroyed from the uh, growing hatred of mankind, the growing hatred of others, the growing pitting race against race, and one race more important than the other, the ultimate rise in murder and crime and sexual deviancy, the mass shootings and the crime explosions. Sexual immorality at all-time high while celebrated in the public square. Truth is being trampled on. Materialism and hedonism worshiped. Government incompetency and government lies and dishonesty. Insurmountable national debt. Teen suicide at all-time high. And we don't think there's demonic activity in the world today. Prescribed. Psychosomatic drugs at an all-time high today, treating alcoholism, drug addiction, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Alcoholism, drug addiction, pestilence, the family structure being trampled on and broken, a turning away from God and a turning to evil. And this is always the equation when God is thrown out of the public square. How deceived can people be who actually laugh at God and hell, the place prepared for demons, these demons, who will be their fellow prisoners, think about that, and they will be at their mercy throughout all eternity. How scary is that? To think that so many people worship Satan knowingly or unknowingly only to find out one day that they served a false God who never loved them, who never had their best interest to heart, but only wanted to deceive them, get them to be where they are, torment them, kill them, and drag them in eternal hell. And they sit there and say, you get to spend eternity with them. These are evil, the epitome of evil, antichrist. And it's alive and well. It's our battle. It's our spiritual warfare. 
In 1 Timothy 4.1, we are forewarned that in the latter days there will be a departing from the faith of those who have given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. God is warning us as we sit here. And we're told to, in Ephesians 4.27, not give the devil an opportunity. That means you have the ability to not give him one. Praise God. (laughs) So yes, this evil spirit certainly knew Jesus. And they knew about Paul. As we said in a previous message in this Acts series, Paul was known in hell. But who are you, they say. To these seven pretenders, uh, who do you think you are? Who are you? Who do you think you are just by uttering the name of Jesus who we recognize and know and to think that you have the power to command me to do anything? You're not a believer in Jesus. You do not have the power of God working through you to cast me out like Paul does in verse 11 or 12. And like the other disciples had in Luke 10, 17, where those disciples, the Lord's disciples said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So then, just to prove they knew he had no power, they wanted to show him. And the man possessed with the evil spirit put a beating on those sons of Sceva so bad they didn't know what was coming. Think about this. They show up with clothes. They leave naked. They got thrown down, beat down. I mean, can you imagine the scene? It says that they left wounded. Let's really understand what that word in Greek is. That word is traumatized. They left traumatized. And no doubt terrified. So let's ask ourselves the question today. Can anyone listening here today or tuning in here today or who's here today become possessed by a demon today? Absolutely. In case you are wondering, you may be saying, wait a minute. I'm a Christian though. Can Christians be possessed by demons? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There is not one reference in the Bible of such an incident. Yes, you can be possessed by a demon here today. But if you're a true follower of Christ, his child, an authentic Christian, there is not a chance of it now, in the future, ever. But if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you stand there with your front door, back door, windows, every orifice in the house open. You see, we as believers can take great comfort and great encouragement to know this. As believers, we are God's own possession, Titus 2.14. We are indwelt and sealed in Jesus by the Holy Spirit, and our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. So while Satan and his demons may oppress and oppress a child of God, we saw that, Job, we just went through Job, assaulted by Satan. We've seen in the Word that Peter is sifted by Satan. We see Paul is tormented by Satan, etc. The fact is, they can never, no, never, never, no, never possess a child of God, nor defeat the believer who has God on his side. That's the truth. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
I praise the Lord we have victory over sin through Jesus Christ, victory over death, victory over evil, and even see in Matthew and Hebrews, we have ministering angels on our behalf. You never, ever fight evil alone, nor do you ever have to succumb to it and be beaten and traumatized by it. Praise God for that. So in this demon beating... It says, the demon beating became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, which ultimately led to the book burning. Let's look at verses 17 through 19. This, the demon beating, became known to, known, and the uh, uh, driving out of the demon, became known to all, both Jews and Greeks who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everybody. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. What we see here is the fear of God, kind of what we saw last week in Pastor Jacob's message and the sea being tossed about with Jonah. The fear of God fell on them, and multitudes began to turn to Jesus for salvation. Praise God. Verse 18 says, they kept coming. They just kept coming. One salvation after the other. It said they came confessing their sins and disclosing their practices, which in the context here is the disclosing their involvement in the occult with their practice of magic, worshiping false gods. And many of those who practice magic, what they do? They brought their books and began burning them in the sight of everyone. Wow. Do you know the estimated value of the books? It says 50 pieces... 50,000 pieces of silver was equivalent to 150 well-established employed men's salary for a year. This is some expensive books. Early church fathers wrote of the fame of the Ephesian Gramada, or the magical writings, that for them to burn such books with all their coveted secrets, these coveted secrets and charms to control the evil world, was a tremendous sign of God's regeneration, his transforming work in the hearts of these people. We saw in the first love series, it may be good for you to go back and listen to that from time to time, that this book burning was a demonstration of their first love to Jesus Christ. They had a break with their past sinful life in the corrupt occult world of Ephesus. And that break was clear. It was absolute. There was no confusion of wondering what side they now stand on. They were willing to sacrifice everybody, anything, for their new Lord and Savior. It is why in Revelation, 40-some years later, that Jesus says, you have forgotten your first love. This is in no way legalistic. I'm getting tired of hearing people call people legalistic falsely. It's never a term. It's so overly used today, it's quickly attached to any believer who burns the books of sin in their life. This is not legalism. This was a hard attitude from transformation of love for Jesus and hating all that represented their sin destroying the previous pathways of evil spirits' influence in their lives. They wanted a clean break. Jesus saved them from that. He paid the price for those sins, and they wanted to get rid of all that represented. This church was known. They were known throughout the region as the church that loved Jesus Christ first. Do you remember... When God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, their journey to the promised land was filled with troubles. It was filled with trials, grumbling. It had the absence of joy. Do you remember that? And most, 
except for a remnant, never did enter the promised land. What happened there? I think you heard about it in Sunday school a little bit. See if you think, hey, it ties together. Acts 7.43 and Amos 5.26 reveal the sad truth. The opposite of these new baby models in Christ here in Ephesus. Acts 7.43 says, You also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Amos 5.26, You also carried along Sikkuth, your king, and Kiyun, your images, the stars of your gods, which you made for yourselves. They didn't get rid of their gods and their idols. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they secretly carried them along with them. They did not make a clean break with their old world. Burned the books, so to speak. They held on to their old loves, and they were not fully committed to loving and trusting the Lord who saved them. Ezekiel 27 said, they did not get rid of, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. What would have happened here in Ephesus? Had the new Ephesian believers not rid themselves of their pastful, sinful idols, their books of Satan, their incantations, they would have done the same thing Israel had done. I mean, think about it. What they did is considered extreme. How many of you have heard Christians attacked by other Christians because they want to live extremely godly. Well, the rest of the world is doing it. The rest of the women dress this way. The rest of the men watch this. It's only PG. It's only R for violence only. And on and on the excuses go. What is happening in our lives and in Christianity today? They did not get rid of, nor did they forsake the idols of what they were saved from. What they did is considered extreme. Burning all those books worth 150, 150 annual salaries of well-employed human beings. What they did, though, should be the normal expectation of what comes from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It should be the normality of the transformation and the Holy Spirit indwelling us. They were taking a stand to rid themselves of demonic influences, taking a stand to shut the doorways in their life. You see, the Ephesians church, the Ephesus church would have been mired in the intertwining of the world they lived in and, and, and the following Christ, and they would have weaved that together. Imagine the result. It would have paralyzed them for being the church on the move. It would have allowed all kinds of demonic activity right inside their midst. Let me ask you, how is it with you, my friends? What is going on in your life? What is going on in your inner private life? What is happening in your heart? What drives your thinking? What is going on privately? Is there a need for some book burnings? Getting rid of, forsaking those things that are robbing your Lord of the love and the devotion and trust that should go to him only? Is there any area in our lives in the church today that is allowing access to demonic oppression and activity in your life? Secret sins and practices that are robbing you of the joy that you should have 
that are robbing you of the joy of your salvation. Why is it there's Christians today that every week they're crying, 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 and so unhappy with their life? Why is it that in Christianity today so many are wanting to commit suicide? So many are turning to drugs and alcohol and pills and on it goes. Secret sins that rob and destroy. See, it's not just your sin nature, the old man you're dealing with, but you're dealing with principalities that attack us on a daily basis wanting to harm you. Are you having things in your life that open pathways for demonic oppression. As shocking as we saw this demon beating, and as wonderful as the book burning is, let's close today with the real emphasis of this section that we can take great comfort and joy in. The word growing. It says, so the word of the Lord was growing, which is increasing, spreading mightily, and prevailing. You see, this word prevailing is the same word used in verse 16 of those demons who overpowered, that demon who overpowered the seven men. Same word. God's word, everyone, overpowers evil. God's word always prevails. And there is a very real lesson here. In countries where Christianity puts God first in their nation, the word of the Lord prevails. Where the, where the word of the Lord is magnified, occultism, witchcraft, and Satanism are overpowered. In fact, you can't even hardly get a percentage of finding out through a census if they're there. The Christian and the Lord prevail and win who live those lives. But what's the lesson? What's the warning? The reverse is also true. It is no surprise that as America moves more and more away from God, more and more away from the fundamental truths of God's Word, we are seeing Satanism, witchcraft, and all forms of occultism increasing, rushing in the atrocious sins of the abominations and curses of God. Are you shocked by that? No. You see, only to the believer in Jesus Christ, do not let today's message discourage you. Do not let the fact of demons frighten you, but rather let it inform you and let it fortify your faith in what's going on around you today. Because Satan and his demons cannot take you out of your Father's hand, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. Praise God. Satan and his demons cannot separate you from the love of God, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor this things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, depth, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, written that way, covers everything, anything, all things. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Guess what else? Satan and his demons, they cannot resist the Lord Jesus who is your strength. We've seen this. When they meet Jesus, everybody, they bow down and worship. So be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might so that you will be able to resist. You have the Lord God and his power to help you walk the life God's called you to, to be separate, holy, his treasured possession. And Satan and his demons, everyone, they cannot win. You don't even have to start the game hoping to see who wins in the end. You already know. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and what will happen. 
he will flee. He will flee. As we put on the armor of God, everyone, lean on Jesus Christ. Resist the devil. You will and we will, as a church on the move, we too will grow mightily and prevail to the glory of God. You know, this Ephesians church, wow. It was an evangelistic church, let me tell you. They couldn't quit telling people about their Lord. They spread the word and magnified, it said, verse 17, the Lord Jesus. If we all, if all we do here at EC Grace is teach the word, live the word, spread the word, and magnify Jesus, we will be doing all the Lord wants us to do. And we will see the Lord prevailing in your life. We will see the Lord prevailing in your family, overpowering hardened hearts and evil spirits. And we will see the saving of souls, even, yes, now, in those last days. So let me encourage you to please, Ephesians 6, continue to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, his armies and demons. Look at your life, my friends. Give no ground. Give no ground. Give no place for Satan to work in your life or for any demon. I love you too much. Are you, pray for me that way too. Don't give an inch. Don't give a centimeter. Stand firm. You have the power of God in your life. Next, have you made a clean break? Have you gotten rid of those things that characterize your old sinful life, your old ways? What, if any, of those have seeped back in over the years? Are there some things you need to burn up that are robbing you of the commitment and that love we should have for the Lord Oh, let me beg you, let me plead with you that when we're right with the Lord, when we love him above all things, he is so pleased we have the perfect fellowship and union with him. There is nothing separating us through sin. We must allow Jesus to sanctify our hearts and our minds and our walks daily. Go to him quickly in sin. Go confess to him quickly. Keep short accounts with God and go ask him, Lord, please, please, please deliver me from evil. Have that heart. He will give you the power and the strength to do that. And last, let's magnify Jesus Christ. Who else do we have to magnify but Almighty God, Almighty Jesus? Let's get out there. Let's get the word out there. You're holding the prevailing word in your hand. It cannot lose. It cannot fail. It's the only thing that's living. It's active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And it takes names, the names that Jesus has prepared in advance. Just go be his emissary and yield it, swing it, thrust it, do it. Get the word out there, for it is that word that changes lives. It is the word of God that delivers people from bondage and the forces of hell. And we say, God, praise you. Thank you for my deliverance. Thank you for my deliverance. What a wonderful opportunity in the day we live in. Yes, live your life. Yes, enjoy your life. Yes, go to work. Yes, do what God's called you to do. But are you seeing through the eyes of Christ your opportunities? I pray that you are. If you're here today and you can't say, I have that protection, if you can't say, I can never be snatched out of the Lord's hands, if you can't say, you know, I don't know that I've ever given my life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you today, you do not have to be oppressed. You do not have to be dealing with the chains of sin that hold you down. The chains of sin that have cost you your very life and you don't even know it. For Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that he came, that he gave his son for you. That if you just believe in him, you won't perish but have everlasting life. God can free you from this. He can free you from this and purchase you off those chains, off those chopping blocks, and he can bring you into his kingdom. He wants to save you. 
It's Jesus alone who paid the price for your sin. For Jesus has conquered death. He conquers all evil. And he says, I can free you from that. I trust today, if that's not you, that you'll come. Let us show you how you can know the Savior of the world. Come. Let us pray with you. Reach out to us. If you're here today and you're being kicked around by demonic activity, oppression, come. We'll help you. We'll pray with you. Are you in need of of a book burning in your life. I pray whatever God shows you, you get out his spiritual lighter and you torch it through the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll be pleased.